emphasize how important this is for all of us, and, and especially, you know, uh, uh, we wanted to uh, introduce a lot of our progress to, to one members uh, to this important topic of financial affairs. Uh, this has been, um, especially nowadays, it's really important. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, you know, between the US and Mexico, we have at least uh, uh, 1 million people crossing the border every day. In our region, El Paso and Juarez, we represent about 82,000 people come from Juarez uh, uh, on a daily basis. Obviously, this is during normal times. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of perspective of you know, the amount of flow that we have or dynamism between the two cities. Um, we, uh, we represent almost 20% of all the whole trade between the US and, and, and Mexico. Uh, and, and now considering that Mexico is number one trading partner with the US, you know, that's a huge chunk and opportunity for, for us. The way we see it is that we need to continue working uh, at the binational region because we are a region that is geographically interconnected, uh, but at the same time, we are very isolated. We, we are on average more than 500 miles away uh, to the next big city in any direction, call it San Antonio, Denver, uh, uh, Phoenix or Chihuahua city. So it doesn't, it, the only thing is, you know, what makes sense is to try to work together between El Paso and Tua Juarez and find better opportunities and tackle the challenges together. Uh, obviously this has been, well, last year has been uh, very complicated with the, with the pandemic. We're still with this situation, uh, but we're definitely, there's been a lot of meetings and in collaboration between different uh, authorities on the public and private sector between Tua Juarez and El Paso as well. As, as Chihuahua. So we're really happy to have all of you here today. Uh, we're excited to continue this collaboration uh, between our two, uh, to learn more from our consulates and to initiate this uh, broader collaboration between uh, Juarez and El Paso and Chihuahua, between Progress 221 and the Desarrollo Economico of Juarez and Chihuahua. Uh, now, uh, you know, we have, um, I'll introduce uh, Ms. Jessica Carrera, who is the president of Progress 221 and also the, the Director of uh, Economic Development for the City of El Paso. I just want. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Bienvenidos a todos and welcome to our progressors. Uh, very excited that you're all joining us today. Uh, Progress 321, as Mario mentioned, uh, is a group of just purpose-driven professionals that are dedicated every day to make our region, you know, the best place to live, work, play, and visit. Um, we are very encouraged that we are kicking off the year with our two Consul Generals on both sides, the United States and Mexico. Hence, three, two, one, three states, two countries, one region. So uh, again, thank you all uh, for the opportunity and thank you to Desarrollo Económico uh, de Ciudad Juárez, uh, Desarrollo Económico in the state of Chihuahua. Uh, we are looking forward to continuing our partnership uh, on behalf of Progress 321. So welcome everyone and we look forward to, 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 to this webinar. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, also, we want to hear from Alvaro Bustillos, who is uh, the president of Desarrollo Económico in Ciudad Juárez, and who is a great ally for, for, the, uh, for the whole region. Thank you, Alvaro. Gracias, Mario. Um, pues, darle la bienvenida a todos aquí al Consul Cohen. Primero que nada, bienvenido de, de, de nuevo. Tengo entendido que usted ha sido un gran aliado para nuestra región y participado muy activamente aquí en... en, en Ciudad Juárez y en el estado, a nuestro cónsul eh, Ibarra también, bienvenido cónsul, un gusto saludarle. Yo quisiera dar un mensaje más en el sentido de las oportunidades de lo que se viene para nuestra región. Yo creo que en, en un próximo futuro o presente tenemos que estar más activamente colaborando entre empresarios, entre oficiales, entre nuestras ciudades hermanas para buscar atraer a las oportunidades que se nos presentan. Creemos que, que aquí eh, estamos bendecidos de estar cerca ahora en frontera con Texas, que se vuelve ahorita en el entorno económico una eh, potencia, eh, dadas las oportunidades que están repatriando a, a Texas, y tenemos que ir de la mano colaborando en muchos sentidos. En ese sentido, pues, darle las gracias de todos nuestros socios de desarrollo económico y todos los que están participando ahorita, a, a los socios de Progress 321. Gracias por participar y con esto les dejo mi mensaje. Gracias a todos. Muchas gracias, Álvaro. Este, bueno, pues ahora podemos continuar eh, con nuestra presentación. 
Vamos a iniciar con nuestro Cónsul General de México aquí en El Paso. Bienvenido, Cónsul, nuevamente, y el piso es de usted. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Eh, muy buenas tardes. Eh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Mauricio Ibarra Ponce de León, Consul General of Mexico in El Paso. And first, I would like to recognize uh, Jesse Herrera, um, Álvaro Bustillos, eh, Mario Porras, who organized this uh, event, also Fernando Alba. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I would like to recognize my, my colleague and friend, Eric Cohen. Uh, He, he just arrived a few months uh, back, uh, but it seems that we know each other for a long, we've known each other for a long time. And, and this is uh, a, an incredible relationship that we have established with our counterparts in, in Ciudad Juarez. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a, I'm a career foreign service official. No? I, I started in this business in 1988. And I've been posted uh, to um, to Canada at our embassy in Ottawa, then at, in Washington D.C. at our embassy in D.C. Then um, I was the consul uh, in of Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then I went back to Mexico. Uh, there I was the Director General Fair for Special Affairs, which basically is uh, all uh, security-related issues. And then I became the Director General for North America, overseeing the political border and security issues with the United States uh, and Canada and the trilateral part uh, as well. Uh, as, as part of that, uh, that position, uh, I was able to travel to the border and to see the, the realities of each of the different sectors in, in the US-Mexica border, which I think uh, it's a uh, Quite, quite important. And from there, uh, I became uh, here, I, I came here to El Paso uh, at the end of May of uh, 2019. So I'm really glad. And if I can start, I'll start uh, my presentation basically saying that uh, the consular function, both for Mexico and the US, but for us, it's, uh, it's one of the main tools of the Mexican foreign policy to protect uh, the interests of, of Mexico abroad and, and the community that is residing abroad. Uh, so everybody knows uh, the roles of, uh, of our embassies and consulates are governed by the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and the 1963 Vienna Convention on Consular Relationships. Mexico has 50 consulates in the United States, plus uh, our consular section in DC. We have the biggest consular network of one country in another country. We are all connected. We have the same policies, the same programs adapted in the local way. Uh, for all of us, and, and I won't go into, into each one of them, but I'm going to mention, mention them. Our first priority is the protection of the Mexican community living abroad. And for that, we have different programs, including legal and migratory advice and, and many, many more. We also provide documents. We have the documentation services as a, as a form of preventive protection. We need to provide our community with, a, with, a, with an ID, you know, an identity identification that serves different purpose. So we provide the community with passports, matriculas consulares, which is a, a Mexican ID that we provide to Mexicans living abroad, but we also provide powers of attorneys and any other type of legal document that the community might need. We have, and we are very strong in community services, uh, particularly fo we focus a lot in health issues through our Ventanilla de Salud uh, here in El Paso, we work with Project Vida and for example, with them or through, through them, uh, we provided the, the Mexican community uh, with a place where they can be tested for COVID-19 uh, free no? and without pro needing to provide any, any uh, documentation. We have uh, different programs related to education. We are convinced that we need to to strengthen our labor force. And we provide the scholarships, we work uh, with the different uh, universities um, and higher level uh, institutions. 
no we are just promoting for example a scholarship for the for daca daca recipients here in the united states along with uh, with uh, partners in the united states for example and then we have for example the ventanilla financiera which is part of the advice that we give the community uh, for for uh, the importance of saving financial services how to send money uh, to mexico etc no the importance of paying taxes here in the united states we also we also are very strong in promoting trade and investment but also tourism and mexican culture abroad and these are part of the of the new uh, things that we are uh, doing right now and promoting all these all these issues and obviously we need to strengthen the political relationship with both the state uh, local and federal uh, officials here in this, in this case at the border so basically that's part of what the mexican consulate does in, in general some interesting facts of the of, of the consulate is that it was established the 1st of February of 1925 by President Plutarco Elias Calles, the, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs was Aaron Sainz. And the current building where we are was inaugurated uh, on February 6, 1981 by President Lopez Portillo. The, the, this consulate covers in Texas, both El Paso and, Hots, and Hotspur counties and we also cover the nine New Mexico border counties. We are, we are one of 13 border consulates Mexico has in the US. We have in two in California, Calexico and San Diego, four in Arizona, Nogales, Tucson, eh, Yuma and Douglas, and eh, seven in Texas, Brownsville, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, El Paso, Laredo, McAllen, and Presidio. So how, how do we contribute to, to, to our binational regional collaboration? Well, basically, we, much of what we do is facilitate uh, the dialogue among interest parties in different issues. No? But we, we are always trying to promote the bilateral dialogue again, again, uh, between counterparts. We are an important link, especially in this region, which is a bilateral community uh, where around 68% of, of Pasoans have family in Juarez and the other way around. Um, we, are, we are a link between uh, the communities. And as I was mentioning, mentioning, we promote this dialogue and opportunities between local governments but also we try to include state and, and federal uh, governments in being, if it's commerce, if it's tourism, in any type of issue. Um, we promote uh, bilateral trade meetings. Uh, just before we started this conference, we were talking about the importance of, of promoting these uh, bilateral dialogues in, in, in terms of trade facilitation, infrastructure, uh, Etc. No? So, so, so we promote these these meetings between uh, officials uh, of both sides, and many times we help address any problems that might arise in any specific issue. So we try to to help uh, uh, the parties or the community in trying to resolve. I believe the 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 opportunities as we were discussing as as we started this this event uh, the opportunities that that this border has uh, are amazing no uh, we are going to talk about the importance of of the new USMCA uh, and whenever i talk to different uh, uh, groups i tell them well here at the border is not necessary really to highlight the importance of the USMCA for the border why because only if you could consider, for example, the 10, the 10 border uh, states between the US and Mexico, which uh, among all of them, we, we are around a little over 14 million people. We could be, if we were a country, we could be the third or the fourth economy in the world. No? That's, a, that's the importance of the, of, of, of the border. 
um, the through through El Paso and, and Mexico bridges crosses over a hundred billion dollars a, a year, which is which is huge, and that and that is why this commercial and economic interaction is so important for 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 this community. And let me say that uh, we are very glad that we already have uh, the the US MCA. As you know, the, we modernized the US and Mexico modernized um, the US MCA. It has 20 of 24 updated charters and new ch and 10 new chapters including including customs and trade facilitation digital commerce, labor issues, environmental, small and medium enterprises, competitiveness, and anti-corruption issues. Well, what is the objective for us of the, of the USMCA? First, maintain free trade in the region, provide certainty for trade and investment with clear trade rules, and very important, strengthen North American integration. Uh, I want to tell you that um, Mexico has established a, a high level interagency um, coordination group. And basically what they do is they coordinate between the different agencies uh, that have competence in the uh, or rel are relevant in, in this issue. We coordinate with the private sector, but also we coordinate with our counterparts parts both in the US uh, and Canada. And as part of the implementation of, of the treaty, uh, they created uh, this, this high level group that is going to follow the implementation of the, of the USMCA. And they created a communication strategy to inform the public of, of what is going on. So I want to say that if you want to, to go into this web page, they have all the frequent, frequent questions and answers they have the text of the treaty and all relevant information and you can go into www.gov.mx slash t dash mec no so you can go there and you can find uh, a lot of relevant information and just to just to conclude um, what do we see as uh, as challenges and opportunities in the region I think, uh, uh, and, and I'm convinced of this, uh, and as I was saying, I visited uh, all the border between the US and Mexico. I think uh, the most important challenge is to change the perception of the border. No, outside the border, there is not a very positive uh, perception of what the border is. So um, in, in the case of, of Mexico, we consider the border as an, as an area of economic development technological innovation, research, education, all the best things uh, that, that, that happen in, in reality. So that's, that's what we need to be uh, promoting. And we need to be promoting the best things that we have here at the border, uh, but on a constant basis, because I've been saying that uh, we could be highlighting something, but there's uh, too much information everywhere and if we're not const if we're not sending constantly the message of the importance of the border then it gets lost no against all the all, all these uh, things they going on so we need we need to start promoting border initiatives but showing everybody how they complement each other why because there are there are many initiatives going around no? including including this one but we need to try to to integrate all of them so that we can so that we can all of them can complement each other in benefit of the of the communities on both sides of the border so for that we need to promote coordination collaboration and exchange of information between our parties we need to speak with one voice we need to show everybody outside we need to show the capitals washington dc mexico city that uh, we are all together and that we and, and we want to exploit all the great things that are happening happening at the border so we have to show everybody that the border is really an area of opportunity this is bilateral opportunity because we need to do this obviously in the united states and mexico in on both sides 
but we need to be together in every issue, trade, uh, infrastructure, uh, mobility, in everything. So um, I will conclude my, my remarks, but um, just, just saying that um, I'm very optimistic. Uh, Alvaro Bustillo before the event was saying of the great opportunities that we have here at the border. I agree completely. So I think this is a, an issue that we're just going to to move forward and 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 be known for for great things here at the port. Thank you very much. Thank you, Consul Ibarra, and uh, great advice. We all need to uh, be part of the the positive message of what the U.S. Mexico, and especially the El Paso Juarez border, can be. Este, muchas gracias, Consul. Uh, Consul Coan, muchas gracias. Bienvenido a este webinar. Eh, el piso suyo ahora. Thank you very much, Mario. I appreciate it. Well, good afternoon. Like my excellent counterpart, Mauricio Ibarra, I'm a career diplomat. I began my assignment here in Juarez in, in August of 2020, but this is my second time serving in the city. I was here previously as the deputy principal officer from 2014 to 2018. And in the past, I've worked in Pakistan, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Venezuela, in addition, of course, assignments in Washington, D.C. But suffice it to say that I'm at home here on the border, and I'm really excited to be back here in Mexico. Let me start by thanking Progress 321, Desarrollo Económico de Ciudad Juárez, and Desarrollo Económico de Chihuahua for putting together this event and for the kind invitation to speak today. Hey, Mauricio and I, we know each other well, and I do appreciate his remarks, and we look forward to a good discussion afterwards. Let me talk a little bit about the role of the U.S. Consulate in Ciudad Juarez, as well as our focus on current economic and political issues in the region. I'll start by saying there is no other relationship in the world like the one between the United States and Mexico. It's truly dynamic, vital, and resilient. We share nearly two centuries of diplomatic relations. Our frequent bilateral engagement at all levels strengthens our two nations' common values and strong links in every conceivable sector. Ultimately, the strength of these ties illustrates our shared commitment to build a more competitive, prosperous, and secure North American continent. I'll talk briefly today about the role of the Consulate General, migration, economic issues, security, and public diplomacy, starting with the role of the Consulate General. While the United States typically has only one embassy in any foreign country, in large countries such as Mexico, it may have several consulates. Consulates are typically, typically located in the main cities or provinces, cities in the provinces or states, and each consulate is led by a consul general, which is my role in Ciudad Juarez. Mexico is unique in that it has nine U.S. consulates, the largest number for any country in the world, and that's a clear indication of how highly we value the bilateral relationship with Mexico. Each consulate has a specific district, and our district in Ciudad Juarez is the entire state of Chihuahua. The Consul General in Ciudad Juarez is also one of the largest in the world, indicating the importance of the city in the border of this city in the border region. Consulates provide the same services and carry out the same official functions as the embassy and coordinate their work closely with our embassy counterparts. We follow the lead of the U.S. Ambassador regarding the national priorities as we engage with local government, civil society, the private sector and other organizations to strengthen the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship and address U.S. foreign policy priorities. As the United States has re recently had a change in presidential administrations, the previous ambassador has concluded his time in Mexico and President Biden will nominate a new U.S. ambassador to Mexico. One of the most important functions of a consulate is to provide assistance to U.S. citizens visiting or residing in the area. The consulate in Ciudad Juarez also issues immigrant visas for family reunification and employment and non-immigrant visas for those wishing to travel, work, or study in the United States. We also work with U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies to coordinate responses to threats and help reduce violent crime. Migration. Migration is a key issue in our bilateral relationship. We work closely with the government of Mexico to ensure that migration occurs in a legal, safe, and orderly manner. At the U.S. Consulate General in Ciudad Juarez, we process the final steps of applications for legal immigrants seeking to obtain residency 
in the United States. We also help facilitate legitimate trade and travel by issuing thousands of non-immigrant visas a year. More broadly, we work with the Mexican government and Central American governments on the shared challenge of irregular immigration by both ensuring that migration laws are enforced and by addressing the root causes of migration. We will continue to work with our government counterparts, civil society, international organizations, and the private sector to help improve the economic and security conditions that motivate some outward migration. Economic issues. Trade facilitation is a priority for the United States because our country's economics, econo economies are closely entwined. Mexico is our second largest or largest trading partner, depending on how you measure it, and hundreds of billions of dollars of goods and services move both ways across the border annually. And that's despite the challenges of COVID-19. Our trade relationship supports jobs in the United States and Mexico. And as you all know, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, entered into force on July 1st, 2020. The USMCA updates our trade relations and will promote prosperity and strengthen North American competitiveness. As an example of the consulate's work related to USMCA, uh, I point to something that happened last year, just as the USMCA began. You recall that our integrated North American supply chain str struggled under the COVID-19 restrictions. U.S. businesses in Chihuahua told us about the challenges and the need to harmonize health and economic priorities. We work quickly with our counterparts and colleagues from the embassy, the U.S. Department of Commerce, and other agencies in Washington to help the hundreds of manufacturers who have factories in Chihuahua navigate the COVID pandemic. Facilitating productive dialogue among local government officials, health officials, and trade associations resulted in successfully allowing essential businesses to continue operations while protecting their workers and families. In short, the consulate working with several levels of government created positive results for both of our economies. Security. Security is another central part priority of our bilateral cooperation and dialogue. Neither of our countries can be secure if the other is not. And no country can successfully confront transnational organized crime or the scourge of illicit drugs alone. This is a shared responsibility. We know that when we increase security cooperation on our border, we disrupt the illicit movement of cash, weapons, drugs, and other illicit goods. Our security assistance through the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement is based on cooperation that recognizes the shared responsibility of the United States and Mexico in improving citizen security and reducing the impacts of transnational organized crime. Our assistance is focused on four main program areas, police professionalization, strengthening the, ju the justice sector, developing a 21st century border, and combating transnational criminal organizations. Each program evolves continuously, guided by our shared priorities, and employs the best technical experts and equipment available. We've had many successes in the region, including working with Mexican agencies on border security to keep both US and Mexican citizens safe. And last but not least, our public diplomacy issues. People to people ties and sharing culture are imperative in today's international relations, especially for the US-Mexico relationship. Through the public affairs section, our embassy and consulates throughout Mexico engage on a daily basis in a broad range of people-to-people -people activities, including educational exchanges, English language training, cultural programs, and joint research initiatives. These activities bolster and amplify the same kind of activities US, Mexican, US and Mexican citizens on both sides of the border are already doing every day. Each public affairs section has a press team that engages with media and provides information via social media directly to US and Mexican citizens. Collectively, these efforts keep building bridges of friendship, companionship, and respect between our two nations. We can all work together towards a shared goal of a prosperous, secure, and democratic Mexico, Western Hemisphere, and the world. With that, I wanna thank you all again for the chance to explain a little bit more about the consulate's work and our bilateral relationship. My team and I look forward to your questions and the follow-on discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Consul General Cohen. Um, thank you for your, for your words. Thank you again, Consul Ibarra.
Uh, also, would like to just uh, share the, the the floor with uh, Mr. Sergio Mendoza from Desarrollo Económico, uh, the Chihuahua, uh, just to um, give him a couple of minutes. Mr. Mendoza, Senor Mendoza. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you to our distinguished guests. Uh, obviously, our economies are deeply intertwined. Intertwined. And uh, it is our focus here at Desarrollo Economico de Chihuahua to uh, promote public policy uh, towards uh, achieving a better and a faster economic growth in our economy here in Chihuahua. And, and for these, uh, we need to look at uh, strategic partnerships with our largest customer, the US, of course. And uh, we are seeing these um, phenomena of, uh, I call it the massive migration of supply chains from Asia to North America. And this is a great opportunity for our economies. And uh, one of the questions we have, and maybe Mauricio can help us with this, uh, our Minister of Economy, Tatiana Cloutier, has said that embassies and consulates will help us uh, establish links with uh, US corporations and chambers of commerce and so forth so to help us uh, develop a, a, a plan and, a, and programs, specific programs, so that uh, we can uh, achieve these partnerships that we need to subscribe in the near future. Um, thank you very much again for your for your time and for talking to us about the importance of consulates and embassies. And we look forward to keep uh, working with you in the near future towards uh, these uh, economic growth policies. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Sergio. Este, yo creo que una pregunta para continuar con este comentario de Sergio. ¿Es posible que los consulados puedan ayudar a, a o sea, trabajando juntos en organizar misiones comerciales en ambos lados de, de la frontera? Puedo, este, Eric, no sé si quieres empezar, contesto. No, pues sí, usted. De entrada, Sergio, por supuesto, con todo gusto, es parte de, del trabajo que, que hacemos y por, por supuesto que podemos establecer esos vínculos. Cuenta con ellos, me eh, parece que tenemos que, que tenemos que tener un diálogo más específico, más cercano, ¿no? que podríamos organizar eh, próximamente. Eh, dadas las condiciones de, de la pandemia, seguramente lo tendremos que hacer virtual. Eh, si bien siempre es, es mejor tener algo presencial para establecer precisamente estos vínculos importantes. Y sí, eh, precisamente nosotros eh, trabajamos en coordinación, en el caso de México, con todas las dependencias en México eh, que tienen competencia en el tema para promover y organizar eh, misiones comerciales, visitas oficiales. Eh, en el caso, como yo lo he comentado aquí en En el paso es, es, es muy importante para, eh, en el caso de las ciudades fronterizas en Estados Unidos, eh, que además de fortalecer la relación bilateral eh, en la frontera, ¿no? que es, ese, es un, es, ese es un must que tiene que existir y se tiene que seguir reforzando, pero también vale la pena, por ejemplo, que, que hagamos este tipo de viajes y de visitas a la Ciudad de México, para ampliar, para, para ampliar ese, ese espectro de oportunidades que se tienen y ampliar la red de contactos que todos ustedes tienen. Así que sí, con todo gusto, eh, nosotros lo, lo podemos facilitar y cuando se requiera eh, continuaremos trabajando para, para poder eh, fortalecer la relación de esta región eh, con las capitales de los países. Y, este, y por mi parte estoy 100% de acuerdo que una de las funciones importantes que tenemos es asimismo crear esos vínculos, este, como muchos han dicho hoy, que la, las dos economías son realmente eh, 
este, conectadas de una forma pero muy cercana y estamos conscientes de eso. En, por mi parte, lo que estoy haciendo en este momento, obviamente, dada la pandemia, es un trabajo virtual, es haciendo una, una gira por la ciudad, por el estado de Chihuahua, conociendo a diferentes presidentes municipales y también pues queremos eh, abrir vínculos con las diferentes cámaras de comercios locales. Siempre cuando yo hablo con algún presidente municipal de Chihuahua, de los 67 municipios, pues siempre preguntamos eh, cómo es, cómo es, cómo está la economía, qué es lo que está sucediendo, sucediendo en esa parte de Chihuahua para usar esa información para poder este, ayudar a que Washington y la Ciudad, ciudad de México este, crean eh, políticas para precisamente las dos economías prosperen. Gracias, consules. Um, Álvaro, ¿te gustas? ¿Tienes alguna pregunta? Gracias, Mario. Yo quisiera empezar en una, este, eh, un comentario, este, a ver si los cónsules aquí pudiéramos trabajar en conjunto con ellos. Sabemos de la, de la aceleración que tiene la ciudad, por ejemplo, del Paso, en el tema de los programas de vacunación que están haciendo a sus, eh, aquí a sus residentes. Eh, ¿Cómo podemos integrar a los dos cónsules a jugar un rol más con nuestra frontera, nuestro estado, para que en términos de blindar nuestra región y sea una región muy estratégica en temas económicos, podemos este, acelerar el flujo de poder conseguir el acceso a la vacuna a nuestra región, acá en Ciudad Juárez y Chihuahua, y poder este, nosotros mismos, el, la iniciativa privada, ayudar a nuestros colaboradores, a nuestros empleados, a que tengan acceso a ella. Yo creo que es uno de los temas más estratégicos que tenemos y retos como región de que nosotros como este país en México tenemos en, en términos de rezago. Eh, yo quisiera este, pues ver el, en, en qué manera los dos cónsules se pueden sumar a una iniciativa de tal tipo para que la, este, este tipo de programa pueda fluir hacia nuestro estado y a nuestra frontera. Te dejamos primero, Eric. Muy bien. No, gracias por el comentario. Definitivamente estamos conscientes de que la pandemia, estamos en plena pandemia y realmente no vamos a poder este, volver a lo que asemeja a la normalidad hasta que haya este, una casi que la vacuna pues ya esté pues este, impuesta, puesta en los brazos de, de las personas pues así que estoy definitivamente dispuesto a, a trabajar con, con Mauricio pues en donde se, en lo que se pueda pero realmente es, eso realmente no es algo creo que, que nos compete tanto pues aquí en el consulado de Ciudad Juárez. Sin embargo, sí estamos este, conscientes de la necesidad de que esa vacuna pues este, ya llegue suficiente dosis para que todo el mundo, tanto en Chihuahua como en El Paso, este, pueda ser vacunada para así arrestar la pandemia. Pero al fin y al cabo, pues definitivamente quisiera ya conversar así un poco más con Mauricio mismo para para hablar del tema. Gracias, eh, coincido eh, plenamente con, con Eric. La, la verdad de las cosas que efectivamente el, el gran reto ahorita es eh, poder pasar eh, esta pandemia. Eh, yo creo que nosotros, por ejemplo, aquí en, en, en El Paso, por ejemplo, estamos supeditados un poco a lo que decidan las autoridades locales y del condado de cómo es el proceso de, de vacunación. Eh, ustedes saben que en todo Estados Unidos tiene un lineamiento de la CDC y cada estado está haciendo la labor que le compete para obtener las vacunas y de ahí las están distribuyendo hacia las, hacia, hacia las ciudades. Entonces yo lo que tenemos, nosotros estamos un poco supeditados a lo que se haga, a lo que se esté haciendo de este lado. Eh, pero co coincido, coincido con él, digo, podemos ver de qué manera podemos eh, apoyar. Yo creo que algo muy importante, Álvaro, sería eh, que ustedes este, elaboren 
alguna solicitud un poco sustentada con, con la numeralia que, que ustedes bien conocen del impacto y con todo gusto a través, a través de los consulados nosotros las hacemos llegar. Esto es, esto es, estos son, son temas federales ¿no? que, que los, los, lleve, los administra eh, el gobierno federal en las capitales, pero nosotros sí podemos hacer el conducto para transmitir eh, la, la preocupación que, tienen, que se tiene en la región. Entonces, si podemos trabajar es, este tipo de, de solicitud, con todo, con, todo, con todo gusto nosotros lo podemos hacer llegar a las autoridades eh, competentes. Pero, pero coincido con Eric, no son temas que, que en los que nos vinculamos mucho los, los consulados, pero sí podemos ser los conductos para, para apoyar este tipo de, de peticiones. Gracias. Um, one of the questions from our from our from our audience is regarding the energy sector. Uh, we know that uh, the energy sector is very robust and it's very it's a very uh, important and 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 now a new open market in in Mexico for a few years now. But we understand there's a very close collaboration between the U.S. and Mexico at the uh, at the government level, but at the you know obviously between the the private sector companies. Uh, especially a lot of U.S. companies uh, wanting to get into business or that have been into uh, already into that are already in Mexico uh, conducting business. Uh, we also understand that it can become sometimes a political issue uh, in, in in Mexico or or in the U.S. How do you see um, the the relationship with the new administration in the United States with, with you know with the energy with with this project, with this, um, sorry, with this topic on the energy sector and perhaps uh, utilizing uh, the USMCA mechanism to try to, you know, uh, pursue uh, uh, the implementation of the energy reform in, in, in Mexico. Um, could be a uh, response in English or Spanish. Le I, I would say that uh, for Mexico, we are, uh, you know, very um, excited about uh, this uh, uh, relationship that, that, that we have established with, uh, with, a, uh, with the Biden administration. Um, the Mexican federal authorities have been in touch uh, uh, with uh, their counterparts in, in terms of defining the, the priorities and, and the way we're going to work. And I think it has been very positive. Como ustedes saben, desde hace unas semanas, por ejemplo, el, el canciller, el secretario Marcelo Lebrar habló con el, con el asesor de seguridad nacional Sullivan para tratar temas importantes. Ayer habló con el, con el secretario de Estado Blinken después de, de, de que hubiera sido ratificado. Y la semana pasada el presidente López Obrador habló directamente con el presidente Biden. Y un poco el, el mensaje es, se están trabajando en, en, esta, en fortalecer nuestra relación y creo que nosotros somos totalmente optimistas de la excelente relación que vamos a poder establecer en todos los temas eh, con la nueva administración en Estados Unidos. Ok. En mi lado, para añadir a eso o para underscore, realmente, truly, creo think... que... Um, Mauricio said it best at the end, you know, I share the sense of, of optimism. Okay, thank you. Thank you to both. Jessica, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, so, so seeing that the pandemic, you know, it, it hit the, the accelerator on, on digital transformation, it's impacting every industry sector. Uh, we have a question from the audience that I think uh, is, is important uh, as, we, as we move forward is, You know, we're currently working and defining the border digital economy, uh, the KPIs, just in order to design better strategies for regional economic development. And, and we wanted to ask if there was any strategic initiative on the agenda of both consuls that we can leverage to support this effort. A ver, compañero, ¿quiere usted quiere empezar usted o quiere que yo empiece? Todo tuyo, Eric. Está bien. Sure, we, we spent, you know, a lot of time 
you're talking about in both of our talks and some of the questions, clearly economy, the economic issues loom large here in the border region. And it's true that one of the things that uh, Mauricio said resonated with me um, of, let me see, I, I wrote it down actually to um, uh, change the perception of, of, of the border region. And so really and truly I've noticed, I've seen that oftentimes um, visitors when they come to this region um, are surprised really. Uh, you, it's one thing what you might you know, read in a newspaper f from some other city and it's another thing to be here, you know, right in the immediate environs and to see it, what it's really like on the border. And so um, I, I think obviously with uh, the pandemic, it's made it, it, everything obviously much more difficult, including being able to showcase the region. Um, but we, we certainly want to be able to do that sooner rather than later. And certainly the previous question on vaccines will be key in when we're able to do that. And so for us, um, we, we look forward to being able to, uh, to showcase the region and uh, essentially um, show people what the, um, the potential of this, of this area actually is. And so as far as um, uh, our priorities, I think that's um, it, one of the very top priorities um, that we're gonna have here in this, uh, in the next few years. Yo si bien entendí es cómo podemos seguir promoviendo eh, estos programas digitales o de manera digital la región, Jessica, más o menos sí, en eso. de acuerdo, por programas digitales y, y pues la transformación que está, que está este, impactando los, los sectores de industria y los sectores que todavía se están pues creando, ¿verdad? Los que están emergiendo. Yo, yo, yo creo que digo, es parte de la labor de, de nosotros apoyar estas iniciativas. Yo más bien diría que las iniciativas están más bien en el sector privado, en las organizaciones, y nosotros lo, lo que hacemos es, es retomarlas y apoyarlas. ¿no? Entonces yo creo que, que hacia, hacia adelante vamos a continuar así. Eh, yo creo que parte de la experiencia que nos ha dado a todos eh, estar en estos momentos tan complicados de pandemia es cómo se ha tenido que redoblar todo este apartado digital, ¿no? Y precisamente tener este, estos webinars y todas estas sesiones este, digitales, pues va a tener que seguir siendo eh, pues la normalidad, ¿no? Entonces, eh, yo creo que todas estas iniciativas eh, sí hay que, hay, que, hay que apoyarlas y como decía en algún momento, yo creo que hay infinidad de iniciativas en la región que precisamente están en, enfocadas en promoverla, en promover diferentes sectores, sea el turismo, sea el comercio, sea las dos juntas, el comercio. Entonces, yo, yo lo que sí creo es que tenemos que tratar de generar siner, sinergias con todas estas organizaciones que medio que están trabajando más o menos los mismos temas, precisamente para que tengamos un mayor impacto. Pero definitivamente... Vamos a continuar, yo creo así, yo creo que son muy importantes todas estas iniciativas eh, digitales y sobre todo hasta que, hasta que no podamos eh, pasar esta pandemia eh, y lo que sí es que déjenos saber de qué iniciativas eh, tienen para ver cómo también podemos eh, apoyarlas de manera bilateral. ¿no? Gracias, Consul. Este, adelante, Álvaro, ¿tienes alguna pregunta? Yo creo que eh, voy a leer aquí de las que veo en el, en, el, en el panel de los que están poniendo, ¿verdad? Yo creo que muchas de las preguntas aquí van dirigidas más bien al, al cónsul Coan. Este, es más en términos de las visas, eh, cónsul, eh, cuando se retoma el hecho de las citas y este, porque hay varias gente que tiene que viajar desde México, otras partes del país hacia el, el consulado aquí de Ciudad Juárez. Veo algunas preguntas en esos términos, ¿verdad? La segunda parte es, ¿nos podría abordar un poquito más en el decreto que, que habló el presidente Biden hace unos días, donde pone una restricción a la gente que viene por vuelos y que tiene que tener una, una prueba negativa? ¿Y cómo nos afectaría aquí al flujo fronterizo? Eso no, no, dado que no tenemos aquí vuelos directos de México, pero eh, ¿cómo sería el flujo con la gente que cruza a pie o caminando? O, 
o ya sea en un vuelo privado, en, en esos términos. Primero la de las visas y luego esta. Muy bien, está, está bien. Muchas gracias por las preguntas. En cuanto a las visas, este, nunca hemos cerrado, por si acaso, en todo lo que es la pandemia desde marzo hasta la fecha, siempre, siempre hemos estado abiertos. Eh, como decía el cónsul Ibarra, al igual para ellos, la protección de ciudadanos mexicanos es su primera prioridad. Asimismo, para nosotros, la protección de los ciudadanos de Estados Unidos en el estado de Chihuahua o permanentemente o este, viajando por Chihuahua es nuestra prioridad número uno y siempre será así. Entonces, siempre eh, tenemos que primero, cuando tenemos esos recursos limitados, obviamente tenemos que destinar eh, los, los recursos a la protección de los ciudadanos de Estados Unidos. Y luego, eh, en cuanto a la prioridad, son las visas de residencia y luego salen las visas temporales. Entonces, nosotros en, en Ciro Juárez no mencioné en, mis, en mi discurso antes que en Ciro Juárez es el único lugar en todo México para tramitar una visa de residencia. Entonces, este, eh, por ende, somos un consulado tan grande, el consulado, pues, eh, la sección consular, mejor dicho, más grande del mundo. Entonces, eh, si uno vive en el DF, si uno vive donde sea, pues, tiene que tramitar su visa de residencia, este, con muy pocas excepciones, en, en Ciudad Juárez. Y esta es una prioridad para nosotros, para cuando la pandemia nos permita, cuando el virus y la vacuna cooperen con nosotros, que podamos tener más gente trabajando dentro del consulado y obviamente más mexicanos visitando nuestro recinto diplomático todos los días para poder atender a la demanda que no ha sido satisfecha durante los últimos nueve meses en cuanto a residencia. En cuanto a las visas temporales, estamos tramitando unas visas para trabajadores de, de, del sector agricultura, eh, agricultura del sector eh, también visas temporales para turismo, para visas este, para turistas, para este, estudiantes, pero una cantidad muy limitada. Así que realmente es muy difícil, como decía el, el ex beisbolista Yogi Vera eh, de los Yankees hace mucho tiempo, él decía, las predicciones son muy difíciles, sobre todo cuando se trate del futuro. Así que es muy difícil predecir con certeza cuándo vamos a poder estar tramitando visas de forma normal. Pero tengan ustedes por seguro que lo que queremos es llegar a ese momento lo más pronto posible, porque este, nuestro consulado tiene una, tiene, tenemos una misión muy importante de facilitar los viajes legítimos, porque son importantes para la economía de México, son importantes para la economía de Estados Unidos, para el paso. Entonces, eso estamos muy conscientes de eso. Así que quisiera darle una respuesta más, más directa, pero simplemente en eso estamos. Pero en cuanto a la, a la otra parte, que es ese decreto de la nueva administración, pues no he visto, no he visto, eh, este, nada todavía en cuanto a cómo se puede afectar el flujo de personas eh, en la frontera caminando o yendo por, por, por automóvil. Hasta la fecha no han habido, que yo sepa, eh, cambios de eso. Y obviamente en cuanto sepamos cualquier cambio que pueda haber de eso, pues con certeza vamos a este, publicar eso y explicar eh, esto, los detalles de, de lo que sea. Y este... También se me olvidó de mencionar una cosa que también eh, lo que hemos este, estado haciendo durante varios meses ahora, normalmente para uno pedir una visa temporal hace falta este, una entrevista con pocas excepciones. Lo que hemos hecho es este, abrir las excepciones para que más gente califique para renovar su visa sin entrevista. Este, si no me equivoco, eh, uno puede, si la visa se venció, eh, en los últimos, mmm, yo creo que son 24 meses, Ajá, son dos meses, en dos años, en los últimos dos años, pues así eh, uno puede venir eh, sin pedir cita. Antes eh, la regla era eh, este, después de 12 meses. Entonces, en pocas palabras, es más fácil ahora para poder renovar la visa porque estamos conscientes de que es más difícil gracias a la pandemia, que la gente se presente en persona en el consulado. Ok. 
Muchas, muchas gracias a uh, Consul Juan. Uh, Fernando, este, tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta. Eh, rápido, no sé si tenías, este, querías hacerla. Mira, eh, se nos está cerrando el tiempo. Yo en todo caso le, le preguntaría a Sergio si tiene alguna pregunta más. Este, digo, yo digo, para, para no perder la oportunidad, simplemente eh, mencionar que por aquí en el chat, en el QA, nos están preguntando, y lo voy a hacer en inglés, y, este, muy rápido. Dice, what policies are envisioned through the SENTI program? Dice, even though it's a privileged service, not a legal right, there is no clear communication for un unauthorized work travelers. SENTI program reserves the right to refusal without explanation. Este, dice, uh, this program is highly important for the continuous commercial relationship between these two countries. Eh, so, uh, si, si les parece, la complementamos con la palabra de Sergio y la pregunta de Sergio, perdón, y, y yo creo que eh, con eso, continu, eh, con eso eh, concluimos la reunión. Adelante, Sergio. No, I, I do not have anything to add or uh, any additional questions. So, let's leave the floor for that particular question that you just asked. Thank you very much. Adelante, Consul. Gracias. Was the, was the question on the, the Sentry program? I didn't quite hear that. Well, I think. Yeah, it was a, a question on the Sentry program and what policies are envisioned through the Sentry program. I, I, I will say is maybe what, what the future of the program, any changes, uh, so on and so forth on this on this matter. I, I, yeah, the, the, you're you're right. The, the question you know frames it very well. It's it's a very important program for not just this border region, but the entire U.S. Mexico border region. Um, I have my own. Sentry card, actually global entry card, and it's my my prized possession. I it never leaves my side. It's the I always tell people it's the, the best hundred dollars I ever spent in my life. And so, as far as the question goes, you know, the Sentry program, of course, is part of the Department of Homeland Security, which is you know a different federal agency from the Department of State, and you know, that's a domestic program rather than overseas program. So, I, truly, I'm not aware of any changes coming down the pike on the program, but certainly. Uh, just as I mentioned, with any changes on uh, crossing the border, um, I would certainly, as soon as I know something, if there is anything to know, we'll certainly make sure to, to publicize it, but I'm just not aware of any changes. Thank Mario, yo, si, si me permiten, eh, vi ahí alguna pregunta de beca, si quieres, si, me da, si, si la puedo contestar, si no les importa, rápidamente. Vamos un minutito, por favor. Bueno, rápidamente, eh, como saben, nosotros, el Consulado de México en El Paso trabaja con universidades como UTEP, el Colegio Comunitario del Paso, con NMSSU. Nosotros les proporcionamos recursos, ellos los, los duplican y se entregan las becas. Las becas las entregan las universidades directamente. La referencia que hice ahorita sobre esta beca nacional que estamos promoviendo, el Gobierno de México eh, se alió con la organización The Dream US, para entregar becas a Dreamers, para todos, para aquellos jóvenes de preparatorio y colegios comunitarios que son recipientes de DACA. Eh, ahorita eh, hay una beca que se está ofreciendo para, si, que puede llegar hasta a 33 mil dólares para, para hacer una carrera o hasta 16 mil 500 para una carrera técnica. Entonces tienen hasta el 25 de febrero para solicitar esa beca. El gobierno de México está aliado con esta organización que es la que eh, Dream US, que es la que las está proporcionando. Nosotros las estamos difundiendo, pero es exclusivamente para beneficiarios de DACA o también del programa de, de, TS, eh, de TS, TSP. Sí, eh, de, de, de TSP o para aquellos eh, personas que llegaron a, a Estados Unidos. Eh, antes del primero de, de noviembre del 2015. Entonces, sí les, sí les aprovecho el, el comercial para, para cualquier eh, joven de preparatoria de colegio comunitario que quiera tratar de recibir. Son mil becas las que está, las que está proporcionando eh, Dream US eh, y pueden solicitarlas hasta el 25 de febrero. Se puede meter a la página de Dream US eh, Diagonal eh, National Scholarship y ahí tendrán ustedes la información para que puedan acceder a esta beca. Muchas gracias, Consul. Um, 
Bueno, pues a todos, uh, muchas gracias. On behalf of Progress Ship to One, uh, Desarrollo Económico de Ciudad Juárez, Desarrollo Económico de, de Chihuahua, we thank you all for joining us. Uh, this, was, this has been a great event between uh, Consul General Ibarra and Consul General Cohen. Álvaro, Jessica, Fernando, Sergio, uh, muchas gracias. Espero que lo hayan disfrutado y estamos este, en contacto. Muy amables a todos y saludos. Saludos, muchas gracias. Sergio, Jessica, Mario. Hasta luego. Gracias. Gracias, saludos gracias, a todos. Gracias por la invitación. Hasta luego. Buen día. Bye.